Usually when a story ends, it does precisely that. It ends. But that isn't the case for all of the members of the Stardust Crusaders. They don't get that type of freedom from the hold of all bad that happens in JoJo. But let's look to our heroes of part three. We have one last train for all. The biggest tragedy that we experience with Avdol, I'd say, is the lack thereof. I consider that he's essentially the second leader in command as he and Joseph were the original two members, but it's honestly surprising because he saw the threat in Dio and united with others in the takedown of the beast. So I wouldn't be against saying that Avdol got out of here cleaner than the most, uh, you know, if it wasn't for the glaring death of his character, but you know, aside from that, you could think that he might have been able to live a reasonably pleasant life alongside Joseph, sort of a, a close family friend, somewhat like Speedwagon. Iggy didn't have the most of him, but he was there when the team needed him to ride. The case of Avdol and Iggy, while ended short, pushed hard for the group as a collective. Now, the next four, this... I wouldn't use pleasant as a word to describe their lives, but I would say that they did make a lot with living. Now before Kakyoin had been in the Stardust Crusaders, he was a minion of Dio for a bit, but before that, he was a loner. It wasn't because kids had disliked Kakyoin, on the contrary, he didn't want to make any friends and he kept himself distant. You might think that this was some sort of self-imposed rule, and well, yeah, you'd be right. But I'd like to consider this perspective. To him, he's living in this world where no one can see what he's seeing. So having a stand doesn't lead to some sort of instant understanding of it for the most part. Even with Jotaro and his menacing demeanor, he had put himself in jail because he didn't understand what Star Platinum was or what it could do. He saw it as something that could danger his mother, and he didn't want anybody close to him because of this. Likewise, Kakyoin had closed himself off to other kids and didn't make friends, most likely because he didn't wish to hurt anybody. And you know how that played out? After the removal of Dio's flesh bud, Kakyoin is tapped into the group. This is the first time Kakyoin has had a friend group. And guess what makes up the group? It's other stand users. These people most likely share similar experiences, especially Jotaro and Kakyoin. And it's, it's wild, you know, how much this meant to him because he was able to pull the last remaining energy he had to help Joseph figure out Dio's stand. And he did great overall. He finally had his friends. The biggest issue though, I think, is I just don't know if his parents ended up getting that memo. So I'm gonna go on with Joseph as if you watched Battle Tendency. If you didn't and you got here, I'm honestly surprised. Hello, nice to meet you. I, uh, I don't believe we've met. Uh, we understand Joseph's character this time around, considering he had a whole part dedicated to him. It's just been a while since then, and we've seen what it's like when he's in pain. When Caesar had died, it destroyed him, but he saw Lisa Lisa trying to keep composure because the idea was that, you know, there's still a mission to complete. I think that stuck because while Joseph is the most expressive character in part three, he tries to hold back when feeling grief. Avdol and Iggy had died, and the three of Joseph, Jotaro, and Kakyoin had to keep it together to maintain the composure required to confront Dio. If there's a sign of weakness or wavering, this will destroy them. And we saw this with Polnareff because he tried to confront Dio immediately after killing Vanilla Ice, but he was cracking under the pressure uh, of just this menacing energy of Dio. But, you know, here's the thing. When Joseph had seen Kakyoin die, the vibe was completely off because he was there for it this time. If any other characters saw Avdol and Iggy die, and then Kakyoin, I can't imagine they'd be in the right headspace to fight Dio. If Joseph didn't talk to Jotaro as a ghost, like honestly, where do you think that Jotaro would be? He'd be, you know, swinging blind fury and it's a lot. Joseph and the Crusaders feel a lot, but composure and 
I guess mental fortitude go a long way in this universe. I think Joseph is probably constantly thinking of his friends, especially when you consider that, you know, Jojo, uh, of all people, keeps a photo of the Crusaders on him. And Joseph gives himself more room to feel all that. Uh, after this, it doesn't help that he had Josuke and Tomoko alone in Japan. Uh, I think what's also really sad was the initial thoughts around Joseph returning. Like, hey man, you weren't there to help before and you're here now. Josuke tells him that he doesn't need him. And it's true. He's gone this far without him not being around. So it's like, what help is Joseph uh, as a parent? But Joseph saw this and he wasn't entirely out of his mind. You know, he wasn't senile. That's how we got the Actung baby arc. I can also imagine the framework made for this and how Josuke acts in response. Uh, it was meant up to be like this. You weren't there for me, but you can start doing that by being there for her now. You know, a lot has messed up around Joseph and Joseph has messed up a lot. But I guess I'd say it's more so about what you do after than before. That's sort of like a karma philosophy. Uh, the past was then and he can only try to be better now. Polinarif was on the Crusaders for a while, but he wasn't all there. The case is that he was going through his character arc from the first time that we see him up to uh, the Judgment arc. First, Polnareff was determined to avenge his sister, but when close to it, he was utterly blind with his rage. Then we see where that gets him, with Avdol almost dying. This moment is enormous for his character, considering that to him, overcommitting, you know, is, is one thing, and the idea is just gonna like hurt you. That overcommitting and all that type of stuff is a self destruction type thing, but it destroyed him because he roped in another person into his mental warfare, which got them killed. At least that's what he thought up after uh, he met Avdol again. Polnareff wouldn't let anyone in because he didn't see anyone's motivation as strong as his, but he misconstrued keeping a level head as weakness. Kakyoin manages this by harnessing Polnareff's determination and using it to his advantage so that defeating Jay Guile is possible, but after defeating him, that doesn't solve his other problems. He had still been in this deep mourning for his sister and felt guilty about what had happened to Avdol. Even when getting torn apart by the clay versions of them, he's like, you know, this isn't that bad. I deserve this anyways. So Polner went through this adventure filled with guilt for his lack of action. And then because of his overcommitment, Polner wasn't there and Sherry died. And Polnareff being alone to then fight, that went ahead and got Avdol killed. He felt damned if he did, and damned if he didn't. So he didn't want to bother fighting these clay versions back. But here's what solved it. It's others, letting in others, letting others help you. Kakyoin being there for Polnareff, help Polnareff get to where he wanted to be. And the same went with Avdol. Polnareff just had to be the one to do the final blow because, you know, this is his thing to wrap up. He just needed the guidance in doing so. So what does that say about Polnareff in part five? It wasn't that he was left alone. Polnareff tried to get further in his help with the world and stand users, but then he came into contact with power never seen before, but he had the will to keep going. When considering Polnareff's advice and what happened to Chariot, I see this as a previous generation passing on the torch for the following crusaders on a mission. Even in the form of a turtle, Polnareff to me was in the same spot as a Joseph Joestar. He's vetted, wise, and he's able to see the potential in those beside him. However, I will say that the idea of Polnareff being forced to be alone 
uh, all these years due to Diavolo having such a heavy hand on Italy is extremely sad. I've always thought of like this small comic in my head where uh, Poland Earth is trying to find the will to keep going, but then uh, he thinks about his time with the Crusaders and maybe he has a little picture that he's been holding on to and he just continues to push on because that's what they would have wanted and that's what you know being a Star Wars Crusader was. I really do love this character. And then finally Jotaro Kujo. What could I say about Jotaro that I haven't said before? Like no really like watch my Jotaro video like I've said a lot in that but as for what I consider the tragedy of Jotaro Kujo I'd say that he was thrown to the wolf so early in his life it starts with his father being a Rolling Stone, then even with his mother's love, he grew to be someone who would mentor and teach himself. If you look at his you know, character sheet from Dark Blue Moon Part 3, you understand how different his thinking is because of it all, and he assumes that anyone can just tell what he's feeling just by looking at him, and sometimes it causes misunderstandings between people. People often think he's cold and rebellious and doesn't care about anything, but the case is he's a typical 17 year old kid that just doesn't understand social cues. Like. <laughs> Like, like, come on, man. He doesn't let himself express emotions like that, but, you know, he still gets scared, happy, mad, and sad. All of it. And that's so surprising because, you know, it's not surprising at all. Like, you assume that he just doesn't like to express himself, but that really just is the case. And he does this forever. But let's pull off that, let's just move on to something else. Uh, Jotaro is regarded multiple times over as the strongest stand user. You know, and people in the verse know that too. That comes with its cost. Since he's so strong and on the side of good, he has to be the one to use his power for good and continuously use this strength to just make the world a better place. In this Superman complex to where he has to do all he can to protect everything is, is it, honestly, it, it gets self-destructive. You see that with a lot of these types of characters. If Jotaro needs help, Someone else has to be there to want to help him. Otherwise, he's fighting until the end. Against Dio, Kira, and Pucci were moments where Jotaro felt like, oh, okay, this is this is an all-me thing. I have to be the one to protect us all and let's let's get this done. And he was willing to see it to the end just so that everyone else was okay. But in these moments came Polnareff, Koichi, and Jolene. And if they weren't there, I, I don't think he would have came out of it the way that he did. I think we top it all off with the idea that because of his position in the world of stand users, uh, it also contributed in tearing up his remote family. Jotaro does, I say that, all that he can to ensure that everyone else is good, but stuff wasn't good at home. Of course, it doesn't help that he doesn't know how to express himself that well. How I see it, Jotaro isn't this sort of like vigilante or something bent on seeking justice for all. He's an active force trying to prevent the evil that plagued his life uh, before it harms any others. But because of his pursuit of this better world and just protection of all, it had hurt those close to him because they didn't get that type of connection. And he understands that which is huge because when the opportunity is given to him, you know, between the greater good and what he holds dear to him, he goes with his heart still. The man isn't no God. He's just a guy that's trying to make a difference and a guy that's trying to keep it all together. And that's our last train home. Thank you all for watching. Hopefully I'll see you all in the next one. Until then, peace out and Godspeed.